Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Compass Coffee Talk, our September 2022 episode. Come on in. I think this is our 28th episode, Bill. My co host, Bill Capsalis. Seems like it's the morning. 28. Is that wow? It's a lot. Know. Well, and you know, we started it as we talked about a little earlier, right? Kind of in the right in the heat of lockdown in May 2020, something like that. Yep. So we're very grateful for y'all. Come on in. And we're very grateful for our guest today, John Foraker, the CEO and co founder of Once Upon a Farm a gentleman who has certainly made his mark with some um, leading national brands in our industry. Also his ability to influence up to larger food companies such as General Mills to adopt regenerative agriculture practices. Um, frankly, it's been amazing. Um, I realized that when I served as the publisher with my uh, former business partner, Frank Lampy, who was the editor, this uh, newsletter, from October 2000, so we're talking just about 22 years ago, our cover uh, lead story was about the homegrown roll-up creates a $50 million foods player. Mm. Well, that's when John first got involved with Annie Zinc and built that up to the company that it is today. Um, and then he's taking similar steps working with his partners. And we had Ari Raz on in August as part of the Naturally Network. And you folks may know the actor, Jennifer Garner. She's also a co-founder and sponsor in Once Upon a Farm. So we're so thrilled to have you join us today, John. Thank you very much. And I just wanna take a moment uh, to thank the folks that um, make this podcast possible. First, my co-host, Bill Capsalis, my team at Compass Natural, uh, Elizabeth Hope and Allison Salvati, who helped organize this. And then our sponsors, the Independent Natural Food Retail Association, thanks to Pat Sheridan and all the independent natural food retailers in the United States that are members of INFRA. Go to naturalfoodretailers.net to learn more about um, how you can work with the independents. And then we're so thrilled to work with Presence Marketing. I'm a monthly contributor to their newsletter, and they are a sponsor of Compass Coffee Talk, one of the leading brokers in the natural channel. Um, also, Naturally Boulder, Naturally San Diego, Naturally New York. Thank you very much to those communities. Um, so we're just going to launch in a little bit you know, John, we want to get to kind of the current environment and how you and other businesses can best navigate uh, what I think is a, a, a long economic tale coming out of the pandemic, um, perhaps a, a exacerbated a bit by um, other factors, I think, including a climate change and its effect on agriculture, and also um, to, uh, to a significant extent, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think, has really affected our food supply system as yeah. well. So um, just if you might give our audience a little bit of what drew you to the natural foods industry um, kind of to today, then we can take it from there. So, yeah, many. Um, first of all, thank you. It's great to see you guys again, and I'm, I'm proud to be on your show. Um, yeah, many years ago, uh, my son, who's now 30, uh, was turning about four or five, something like that. He was young. And I came home and my wife had a separate shelf in the refrigerator and there were these beautiful strawberries on one shelf and then some good looking strawberries on the other. And I reached for the more beautiful ones. And my wife said, oh no, no, those are the organic ones. Those are not for you. Those are for Jack. And so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like wait a second. That was in the early, like early nineties. And it was at a time when, um, the organic industry, as you guys well know, too, was like, it was corner store, you know, nat indie, indie naturals and granola bins and, and, and stuff like that. And then there was the specialty food business, which was like Neiman Marcus, Williams Sonoma, Dayton Hudson, uh, Fresh Fields, the predecessors of Whole Foods. And they were doing super specialty stuff and to a, to a lesser degree, like healthy. Those two worlds were so obviously colliding with each other. Um, organic and and better food. And so um, that led me to really be super interested in it from just a consumer standpoint and seeing the, the audience that was coming in interested in that and also just the business opportunity around it. And that's 
how I got involved uh, in the space in my first startup in about 1994. Um, that led to an investment in Annie's in 1999-ish, I think, and then um, I, the, the run with Annie's. So that's really where it started. Were you in the food industry before then? No, actually, I was a banker. I spent about seven years uh, working in uh, commercial corporate lending uh, in the wine industry. And I was super interested in brands uh, as a result of that work. Wanted to transition out of banking. So I went to school, um, a business school at Berkeley to kind of break that. And when I was there, I got involved in a food startup between first and second year. And that's kind of where my attachment to food came. I came from an agricultural community, conventional ag rice growing family in the Northern Sacramento Valley. So I was always kind of connected to food. I was interested in agriculture. And so that's where it came from. Uh-huh. That's where our friends, the Lundbergs are. Yeah. I just, uh, I just saw one of the Lundbergs recently um, in 1977 about, I was like, um, uh, like 16 year old kid uh, or 15 year old kid driving D7 cats, like ripping ag land up there and working for my conventional farmer in rice. And we went over and visited on an ag rice day, Lundberg, and everybody thought it was the weirdest bunch of hippies, like didn't understand <laughs> it. It was amazing. Like, it was like, I really feel like I saw the beginning of that, which is just so incredible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, at first they kind of laugh at you and then yeah, right, exactly. you're the pioneer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were well, geniuses, geniuses. Yeah. You know, can you talk a little bit about Once Upon a Farm, um, yeah. where you are with that? It's its mission, its commission, its commitment to organic yep. um, and child nutrition. I think this is really important. It's a gateway for a lot of families into organic food. As your wife was reserving good <laughs> yeah, organic exactly. strawberries over the forbidden side of the refrigerator for yeah, you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, Once Upon a Farm is um, committed to like uh, elevating kid nutrition. And, um, you know, it was started by Ari and Cassandra um, in San Diego in about 2015. I became an investor in 2016. And then in 2000, 2017, they invited uh, Jen Garner and I to come in as co-founders and really like try to take it to the next level. And um, our, the way I kind of think about it in my own space is like, I spent maybe, I don't know, 16, 17 years at Annie's and Annie's was a brand that really mainstreamed, helped mainstream organic. We were not the only one like Stonyfield, like, um, you know, Cliff, many, many others, but we were one of those brands that like helped bring organic out of the little, you know, tiny spot at the back of the store next to the bathroom where the mop closet was into the mainstream aisles. And um, at Annie's, we focused on kid kid and kid nutrition, and we did it like in mostly in dry products. And we knew it, it was it was really hard to elevate the nutrition in those in those products, even though we always worked hard to have less sodium and and just better overall nutritionals. Um, obviously, none of the fake stuff, colors and, and flavors, and we were focused on organic to a great degree. It was really hard for us to elevate the nutritional uh, component the way that I wanted to. And so when the opportunity came became to get involved in Once Upon a Farm, I saw um, a real, real window of opportunity for that because fresh is obviously like a really big uh, thing on the mind of uh, parents. It's a gateway into organic through produce, obviously. And there was this technology out there, HPP, high pressure pas pascalization, but pressure, basically using pressure. Um, to take these wonderful fruits and veggies, blend them all together, never getting over 40 degrees, using pressure to give to knock back the bad, like harmful bacteria, give you a little bit of shelf life, and then let you put those products on the shelf. And what's so amazing about our products is the, um, the flavor and the color and the texture and the phytonutrients and all the things that don't get beat down by heat when you process with heat. And so Ari Sandra had like in, started this company because Cassandra was solving her own problems. She wanted better baby food for her kids. And when she'd go into the grocery store, she didn't like all the shelf stable things that were there. And so um, she really developed the first fresh baby food and we brought it to market. And um, not only have we brought it to the baby space, we really elevated it to kids and really kind of ages one through seven. And it's turned into a pretty significant brand now. And it's about 12,000 doors in North America. Um, 
it's been really fun. It's been a crazy five years. It's not been easy. It, there was a lot of things we had to figure out. We made lots of mistakes and we've learned from them. But but we 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 are on to something really exciting now. And I appreciate all of the folks that are watching this uh, video who are consumers of our products. That's why we're here and we're doing it for you guys. Nice. Um, a really quick question. Those 12,000 doors, are they all in the natural channel, John, or do you also go into conventional stores? No, we're in conventional stores. We're in you know, Target and Kroger and the like, but um, we have a significant business at Whole Foods and Sprouts and the Indie Naturals are incredibly important to us. In fact, we really started there. We've got um, products that do really well there that are kind of positioned in that channel. And um, I love it. So go to your Indie co-op and um, and uh, support those guys because they're doing a great job with our products. Yeah, but once again, here in Target, you know, you're, you're doing it again. You're bringing freshness and whole goodness to the mainstream. Again, you're doing it again with another brand. It's awesome. Yeah, we're trying to. It's hard, you know, like uh, when we when we first when we first were like, OK, the four of us got together, Jan, Ari and Cassandra and I, and we said, like, OK, how are we going to bust this out? And, and the hard thing is like, you're selling baby food and you're like, where do you put it in the store? There's no coolers in the baby aisle. We could work on that. You, there, it's not a yogurt. We could, we know there's refrigeration over there. Like we had to really figure that out. And it was um, creating a new category is very hard. Um, it's, it's fun, but hard. Uh, that's yeah. what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, we, we can't hear you, Steve. It looks like you lost your mic. There you are. You bet. These these baby foods are refrigerated. That's yeah, so every, yeah, everything we do right now is refrigerated, relatively short shelf life. By the time it gets to retail, it's got like 30 to 60 days on it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so which is also a challenge, like uh, a cold, cold supply chain is a lot more difficult than what I did or what I worked with at Annie's. We're, yeah. we're, right. You yeah, have short shelf life. It's perishable. <laughs> it's all got to be refrigerated. Um, but I also hear that it's the next best thing to fresh the way you describe yeah. the pressure yeah. of pasteurization. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Consumers right. love it. It's very, uh, you, um, you, is your supply chain all local? Where do you, where do you get most of your products? Near yeah, us? We, I mean, we, we source a lot of like tropical stuff. So uh, I'd say about half of it comes from South, from Mexico down to South America and half of it comes domestically U S it's generally what it is. So, you know, the big 800 pound gorilla in the room is uh, inflation and in particular food is seems to be the most impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think among that uh, organic food as well. And it's challenging consumers. Um, I was uh, talking with Aaron Stevens, the co-CEO on uh, this past weekend about Nature's Path. And he says it's not that consumers don't want to support organic. They just may not be able to afford it in today's marketplace. So how's that affecting you and how are you engaging the consumer to, you know, to convey the value? Yeah, well, we're not immune from inflation. It's been endemic in everybody's supply chain. You know, the, the conversation we've been having in the organic industry and you guys have been part of it for many, many years is the, the base of agricultural acres in the US still is very, very low. Um, and consumer demand for organic has been increasing significantly year after year, and the industry's gotten bigger and bigger. And so, you know, the pandemic and the the shifts in um, consumer behavior and everything have just put more and more pressure on that. So what it's what it's done for companies like us is we have to spend a lot more time focusing on where stuff's coming from in the next two years, not just right now. You know, in developing mm -hmm. supply relationships and um, you know, adding growers to our network. And it's just a nonstop effort. You just, you know, knock on wood, we were able to go through the pandemic and all of the, that whole period uh, and still fill our order rates, you know, in the 98, 99% range, which is slightly miraculous because it was really, it was really difficult. And, you know, we've had to carry a lot more inventory. We've had to um, stuff warehouses with, you know, frozen IQF, um, high quality stuff all over this, the, the country. We've had like everything we could do. I think we have like 28 different warehouses all over the country right now, just stuff with materials to stay ahead of all the uncertainty that you have to mm. in the supply chain now. 
That's what I was wow. hearing this morning on the radio talking about supply chain, which uh, I we discussed earlier, I thought was an interesting soundbite. We've gone from um, the supply chain being just in time now to just in case. <laughs> um, but that increases costs for you, yeah. I would think, and also warehousing and all of that. Also, have you seen uh, shipping come down? Because I know it was getting to the point where it, people were paying, you know, 10 times their previous shipping rates for containers. Yeah, shipping has moderated in um, in one way, you know, fuel store charges have come down quite a bit. Some of the lanes um, have gotten less uh, expensive. However, you know, labor and truckers, I mean, are still short and um, are getting premiums. So I wouldn't say it's come way off. It's definitely come off its peaks. So but it's still significantly higher to ship in most places than it was a couple of years ago, no doubt. That, that um, brings up an interesting question as well. The um, labor in your own company, have mm -hmm. you had to reconsider how you, how you work with your workers or have you made any changes or how do you yeah. keep loyalty there? Yeah. The biggest change we made is unlike, I mean, like, like many companies is we went almost entirely remote at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, we had uh, had a corporate headquarters in Berkeley and we were kind of like headquarters centric, like many traditional companies. And we basically went remote because we had to, because of the lockdowns and stuff. And then <coughs> adopted lots of tools to figure out how to do better and work with each other that way. And then about, oh, I wanna say about six months in, we made the decision to just kind of do that permanently. and. Um, we've grown significantly. Um, we've probably more than certainly more than doubled the number of employees since since then, and almost tripled. And we basically relaxed where they are. And so we've our our mantra has been like, we're going to hire the best talent wherever it is. Could be international too. We haven't had that happen yet, but it could be. Um, and it's basically we have people all over the country now, and we figured out how to work it now in the plants. We've got a, a plant we work with in center country and one in Southern California. That's been a different situation, right? So we've had to get people in there and it's really just been the labor, the labor has been the hardest part. Keeping obviously the beginning of the pandemic is working with the manufacturers to keep everybody safe, make sure that we had enough capacity. Um, it was really difficult, but that's that's moderated. It's uh, gotten quite a bit easier. It's, it's still more expensive because we're having and wanting to pay premium to get people who are going to stick around and be with us for a long time, but um, but that part at least has gotten a little more predictable. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned the, the state of organic today. What's your take on the the short term future for organic in general and regenerative? Where where are you guys with that regenerative at once upon? Yeah. So the honest answer in regenerative is not very far because like we've been we've been growing so fast and just scrambling so fast just to buy high quality organic that like going that next level down to like regenerative organic and whatever has been we haven't even been able to spend much time on that honestly um, we do want to but the my my view on organic I, the fundamentals around organic are incredibly strong and are continuing and remain which are. You know, the generation of millennial um, households that came into parenthood that when I was at Annie's, we were going into retailers and going, there's a tsunami of consumers that's going to wash on your stores, on your shores here in a minute, um, that are going to be really interested in organic and cleaner food. That for sure happened. And it's continuing. And the the millennials and Gen Z and all, all of, they care a lot more about where their food comes from, the transparency around it. Um, and and those values are very uh, tied in with uh, organic, in my opinion. And so I think the future is is very bright from a demand side. I think the place where it gets more challenging is the it was what we've talked about before, which is the supply side. And are we doing enough in public policy through the ag programs and um, the USDA to encourage you know organic transitions and support organic farmers and and the economics required to really make that uh, a viable lifelong pursuit. It's hard. Um, so I think that's going to continue to be the challenge for the next decade is it can supply keep up with the demand. Yeah, I think I, mean, I think it has been a positive. Um, we've seen USDA this past summer um, announce a $300 million investment in helping organic farmers transition to organic. Yeah. I think that's 
very helpful. And I think that message needs to get out to the farmers Yes, yeah. uh, in particular. So um, I do see USDA more supportive of organic of late. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's wonderful. It's it's also notable that it's a drop in the bucket in the total um, spending, right? It should be right. more. If you look at the importance of organic in categories, especially categories that face up to um, young kids and families, like it should be more. But you know, th that all that spending is incredibly politically loaded and um, uh, lots of lots of vested interest in kind of maintaining the status quo. <laughs> But, yeah. there, but but the industry has done a good job, like continuing to work on raising awareness of organic and getting more and more out of those programs, which will be good public policy. Well, you know, you're you are um, an important voice out there that people will listen to. And, and I think there is uh, I mean, the other 800 pound gorilla in the room that I think is going to affect us all and food production and and food production also has an impact on it is climate change. Yeah. So this is an issue we're all facing um and, and i think it is going to challenge agriculture coming forward so you must also be bracing for that as well as advocating for ways to mitigate uh, yeah through mm, business yeah. yeah no doubt it's it's th that's a humongous challenge globally and like the way growing regions are shifting and i mean you can just it's going to ripple through supply chains not just of organic but like of everything um mm -hmm. it already is I know. So I think, you know, that's uh, kind of strap in folks a little <laughs> bit on the climate change issue. Um, I'm curious how humanity is going to solve that problem. What's the other meme I saw? We we have two futures. We have the future of Star Trek or we have the future of Mad Max. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, hey, John, I want to go back to the leadership question just a real quick. You've had a lot of different experiences with this, big companies, small companies. And when you made the decision to go totally remote, how did your workforce respond to that in terms of like loyalty, commitment? Um, how do you, I mean, I work with a lot of of company leaders here at National Boulder. And it's a looming question for them, keeping the workforce together, keeping them motivated. How do you do that when you're so remote? What, what are your tricks? Do you have any tricks? Well, I'd say we're on a learning journey with it because right, we, we haven't been doing this long enough to know, like ask me this question 10 years from now and I'll, I'll give you a better answer. But, yeah. but I'll say a, a few principles. One is um, we've adopted technology to help us stay closer than we would otherwise. So we're, we're um, a really strong like Slack using company. We use Slack for everything. And that's helped because it's, can, it's like the visibility that you get by walking through the office and talking to somebody on the right and the left that are different functionals and being able to see and that helps a little bit. We've been really focused on lots and lots of communication. So communication about what the business is doing, how it's doing. Um, every week I write something that, that goes to, not only to our board, but that exact document goes to all of our employees. Um, we do monthly company like uh, meetings online that we really, really spend a lot of time thinking about. And then the piece that, that we're still evolving that I think is a core part of it is we're bringing everybody into um, like quote unquote headquarters or to a central location at least two times a year, which is expensive. Okay. But when you think about, we don't have a real big office lease now. We have a small one in Berkeley still. So there's trade-offs, right? So we're bringing people in. And then what moreover, what's happening is like our functional leaders are going out into the market and saying, hey, all the marketing team's going to go into Denver for four days and they're going to spend three days here. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing. I think it's worked really well. I mean, our engagement is very high. We have incredible employees, as I mentioned earlier, and talent. But I still do worry. Like, I, I like, you know, is there an end point to that? Does it start? You start to get like diminishing yeah. returns from it. So, oh, it's one of the most important areas I think for leaders to focus on is not only is it working now, but will it continue to work? And what are the other things we need to do to continue to to make that? A competitive advantage. I will say this: like our employees love it. I mean, as a general general rule, they love the culture of like flexibility and being, you know, close to home and being able to like organize the their work around their life in ways that 
are a lot more flexible than they had to do than they had earlier and they love that and so there's a lot of things they love but the engagement part is the part that we all have to be concerned about right I like that you're bringing, it's almost like the way Whole Foods does their tribal gatherings, mm -hmm. that you're bringing your people together twice a year. It almost makes that something now to look forward to. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, that's what I've been thinking through this. I mean, Zoom, you can get tired of the Zoom meetings. And yet yeah. it's also, I think, created an opportunity where salespeople don't have to live on airplanes. Yeah. But then the events that are chosen and are more selective become, I think, that much more important. Yeah. And what you can do to structure those for people to engage, to, um, to you know, embed the culture, have people engage in the culture, uh, company culture, I think, actually contributes to a nice mix where maybe... 10 years from now, let's take a look at how old traditional offices and new virtual settings have blended into a new way of working. And that's what I think is happening. And of course, things look, you know, when lava hits the ocean, it's really steamy. You kind of can't see what's going on, but new land is being formed. Yeah. That's a really good way to think about it. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> so. Now, you have been pretty accessible out there. You, I know you have a lot of demands on your time, but I've found you to be so accessible. I know you help a lot of emerging entrepreneurs, brands, and companies you've mentored. Um, what advice for emerging brands, small brands, really? I mean, you're, you, you're established. You've, you've been to the show. You, you've got a new brand you've got in the show, but for brands trying to break into the show right now, it's a, it's a challenging time. What counsel might you offer? Yeah, I, I would say um, it's, it is a very challenging time, probably maybe more challenging time than ever, but I'll also say it's always been challenging and, um, and like, like build a network around you, like reach out to people that can, can give you good advice and, and help learn from your peers. Like I had, I had um, great mentors when I was um, starting my first company. And I have always been of the mindset that I wanted to pay that forward and, and be available for other people, which is why I'm pretty available. Um, but I also like, there's a sense of humility that comes with it. Like I've been in this industry for a long time. I've made many mistakes. I've learned a lot, but I still don't know crap. Like that's my view. And I think I learn as much from um, entrepreneurs that I engage with and help as they learn from me. Like, and I think, so I'm constantly looking for that too. So it's very, it can be very um, mutually beneficial to like engage with really smart people who are passionate about starting something and like the emergence of, you know, digital marketing as a, an art and a practice over the last decade is a great example of that. I mean, and, and the scrappy ways that small entrepreneurial companies grow have really opened the eyes of lots of people and I've learned a lot from that. Um, so I would just say um, it's hard. Um, you know, there's lots of good resources out there. There's lots of good books to read. Just like assess your, you know, the naturally network is like, I mean, I wish that was around in 1994 when I was here. Like get involved in that or in whatever chapter you can. Go yeah. to all of the engagement, learn from those people, build that network. That's, you'll, you'll avoid a lot of mistakes if you just talk to people who have been around for a while. Because a lot of the same mistakes are repeated, you know, um, in the space. It changes, but the, the the highway doesn't much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, you're still driving the same road. It's just yeah. a little landscape out there now. But but yeah, it is hard. And we work with so many innovators in the network, John. I'm glad you brought that up. It's just like the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, work that goes on and the, the constant evolution of leadership and education and training that goes on. Um, people like yourself in the industry that avail themselves to mentorship and all those things, it, it's really valuable. And I know lots of founders who love it, appreciate it, look for it, can't find it somewhere where they are. Um, they need to engage with, you know, the industry in some fashion, go to the shows, do whatever, to meet people and hear them talk about the the state of things. And so that is really, really super cool. That sort of continual regeneration, if you will, of the industry leadership and knowledge base. And I love what you said about being, you know, humble and, and uh, have some humility. It, it's, um, it's pretty evident in everything you do. So oh, thank you. That pretty well, I think. 
the talent that's in this industry now is just unbelievable. Like I, every time I run into these, these entrepreneurs coming in, I just shake my head going, oh, it's unbelievable. Like we're, yeah, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. pulling, we're pulling in the talent that, you know, used to go to the consultants and the investment banks and, yeah. and it's unbelievable. Really. Yeah, exactly. The pitch slams today. There's so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's crazy. Prepared, you know? um, it's great. So I know we're right at the 30 minute mark, John, uh, and I know you have to to, to hit a, a plane. Um, Steve, do you want to maybe get uh, some final comments from John and then we can do a little closeout? John, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today with us. Um, we really appreciate it on behalf of Compass Natural, our small but mighty agency based in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Bill, thank you, my co-host always, also an advisor to Compass Natural, We're really glad to have talking about that kind of counsel and the brains to help you in your business. I'm very happy to be able to count on that as well with a really great group of advisors. Um, hey, I don't know if you're going to be at the ShiftCon conference next month. I will be there. I know, John, you've had that on your radar. I know Ari Adams is coming back after three years, and that's uh, the largest gathering of healthy lifestyles influencers in the country. Yep. So I'll see you there. Will we see Once Upon a Farm at Expo East at all? We won't, we're not going to have a booth at Expo East. Uh, we'll be at West. Very, very good. Do you, are you working on any new things going forward that you could tease our audience uh, about a little bit? Um, yeah, we have a lot going on in the innovation space. You know, you need to work on innovation a couple of years before, easily a couple of years before you make it big. I can't really reveal any of that now, but I will say one thing that's pretty exciting is, you know, the first, the first, um, my first instinct when, when I came here was that we were going to grow the fresh baby business by building out coolers in retail. And we started working on that and we found it was really difficult. We had to learn a lot. Um, we ended up building the brand largely in kind of refrigerated areas of the store that exist uh, already, like where, you know, yogurt and fresh snacking is. That's really the uh, significant part of the business now. However, we never gave up on that ambition and we've been working hard for three years and have got some pretty amazing things happening there. And you're going to see thousands cool. and thousands of baby coolers in um, retail stores in the U.S. Um, over the next couple of years. It's really exciting. Uh, you're going to create your own shelf space. <laughs> your own branded yeah. farm inside the skit. <laughs> yeah, Fresh Pet, Fresh Pet did it in pet food, which is pretty unbelievable. And I always was amazing to me that nobody had done that in baby food. Um, so we will. <laughs> nice, nice. Awesome. Kids and pets. Um, it's where yeah, we spend yeah. our money. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I'd just like to add my thanks, John, for being here. I look forward to seeing you. I don't know if you're going to be walking the show, at least in Philly, or if you have a team there, but we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. And thanks for coming on the show. Steve, I'll let you close this out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll have this posted on our um, YouTube and also our Spotify channel, where you can find all of our episodes of Compass Coffee Talk. On October 19, we will be featuring Heather Terry, uh, the founder and CEO of Good Sam Foods, which uh, is specializing in direct trade, really giving value and, um, and the, uh, the dollars back to the farmers. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from Heather next month. John, thank you very much again. Bill, thank you. Y'all have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us on today's episode of Compass Coffee Talk. We'll talk to you soon. Thank Bye you. now. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys.